It is a pleasure to be with you. Please grab your Bibles and go with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. And as you're turning there, would you join me as we pray to hear the word of the Lord? Father, we just thank you today that as we come to your word that you are going to speak to us. We thank you for this time. We ask that you would awaken our heart and cause us to become people that tremble at your word. Holy Spirit, would you come and release the power of your presence inside our soul so that we could be rooted and grounded in love. And as we hear your word today, let us have the wisdom and revelation to know the hope of our calling in you. And I thank you for this time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Colossians 1.13. Um, I actually have forgotten your name, but the girl that led worship, I'm sorry. Rachel, would you stand for a moment? I, I was actually going to wait till the end of the service, but I, uh, that's why I was struggling in prayer. I felt like the Lord wanted me to start with you, so let's go ahead and do this. Um, actually, while you were leading worship, the Lord kind of drew my attention that he was going to start ministering to you. You're actually now coming into a season of the Lord where I actually saw him engage you with his presence, and I saw you on your knees, and it wasn't that you were leading worship, it was your prayer time that Jesus was actually focusing on, so he wanted me to share this with you. You're going to come into a season where he's going to make his presence known to you in such a unique way that you're going to actually find yourself coming into a new dynamic of understanding not only God's love for you, but it's a preparing stage for what's coming for you next. Um, you've actually been called to do more than just the local expression of Christianity. Jesus has a greater call on you to reach the body of Christ. And so that's what's going to be happening to you. So can we pray for that to be released in your life? Father, would you come near your, your daughter and just cause your goodness to fill her? Let her be overwhelmed by your love for her and touch her with your goodness and your mercy. And this expansion that she's coming into with your embrace, I ask that it would be received and that she would grow in it. I thank you for the good things that you're going to do in her life. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you so much. All right, Colossians, hopefully we'll get to the scripture, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. As we get there, I want to start by just talking with you for a moment about how important it is for you to know your identity in Christ. Um, I have been given the, the privilege to travel around the United States and teach on um, destiny. We have courses where we teach people to discover what their destiny is. And we found that as we were doing it for the first um, 15 years, we would teach people about uh, giftedness, and then we would teach about vision. But we found out that if we didn't come back and establish identity first, what happened is all the good things that God had called people to, they wouldn't believe that God wanted to do it because they couldn't see themselves the way the Lord saw them. So what I had to do is I had to actually go back into Scripture and start looking at the idea of what does it actually mean to be in Christ. You hear that in Scripture, you're in Christ. And uh, what I found is there are at least five different categories of identities that the Scripture begins to come to you and I and begin to speak to you about who you really are and what God has done for you in Christ. And God wants you to begin to not only know these scriptures, but he wants you to start living out of the reality of what is actually truth for you. So before we look at this specifically as an introduction, I want to kind of give you those five things real quick, if I can remember them off the top of my head. All right. First one is this. One of the ways that the scripture talks to you about your identity in Christ is what we would call relational concepts. So God actually comes and says that in Christ you have a different relationship with God. In fact, when I just guys give you, a, uh, I always enjoy coming up to Minnesota because for some odd reason, there's, there's this thing that goes on between Minnesota and Iowa that just makes me laugh all the time. People in Iowa make jokes about people in Minnesota, and people in Minnesota make jokes about people in Iowa. I'm just like, what is it with those two states every time I'm in between them? It has nothing to do with the message today, but I'm, I am fascinated by that. When I'm in Iowa and I ask people, what, do you, what does it mean? I ask them identity questions. What does it mean for you to be a Christian? They say things like this. Well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Now, that sounds biblical, doesn't it? 
And at one point, before you came to Christ, you really were a sinner and you were saved by grace. But after you come to Christ, your identity has changed. And you're not that anymore. In fact, God wants you to stop referring to yourself as a sinner because he calls you holy and blameless in his sight. And a lot of people, because they don't grasp that or they see themselves before they're in Christ and they relate to God based out of that way that they see themselves, what happens is they're having conversations with God that God is not having with them. And so they find themselves talking about their former life as though that's relevant and that is not how God is relating to them. And so what, one of the areas of your identity is a relationship. God has changed his relationship with you. You are unique in his sight. His favor is upon you. Another way, uh, uh, another category that's talked about when we talk about identity is not only relationship, it's the idea that you have been called to be transformed. And so there's like 15 or 20 scriptures in the New Testament and in the Old Testament where it talks about your identity and it says that you have been ordained to be transformed and that's part of your identity. Now, when you begin to understand that, that should change what you expect God's doing in your life because most of us see, well, I change when I meet Christ or I probably change when I have encounters or maybe when I die, I really might change. But the Bible says, no, from the minute you came into Christ, you have been ordained to constantly bear fruit and change consistently. And the change isn't just a change of the way you think, it's what we would call lifting up to a higher level of existence, which we'll actually look at today. The next category that we have is we have this thing called a calling. God has called you, not to either full-time ministry or not full-time ministry, that's how we talk about it, but the scripture begins to say there are ways that God describes you to all of the creation. So this means that when God calls you this, all of creation actually pays attention to how God describes you. And so one of the values that is given to us is this idea that in God's eyes, you are called adopted. You are called the light of the world. You are called the salt of the earth. Now, when I ask people, do you like being called salt? Most people look at me like, yeah, I don't want to be called that. But when you understand what Jesus was talking about and your identity comes into that, a lot of the stuff that you and I experience makes sense because we understand the purpose of what salt represents. Another one that we actually have in scripture is um, what we call position. Now, a lot of people think, well, if I'm in relationship, God, doesn't that change my position? Yeah, but the scripture actually believes you really need to know your position in Christ. So what does that mean to have a position compared to relationship? One is how God relates to you. Another one is how you sit in the world and the authority that actually comes from your life because you're in Christ. Now, these categories, I, I believe I've forgotten one, and hopefully I'll remember as I do the message, but this is important. The Bible spent time trying to develop your identity on a, a, for a very specific reason. In Christ, you are in a different life, a different kingdom, and a different reality. And when you live out of that, it changes everything in your world. So this morning, when we look at this passage, we are looking at an identity statement made about you. So now let's look at the passage. It says this. For he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness... And he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So what is, the, what is the identity or what is the function of identity being here? You have been rescued from the dominion of darkness. That is your identity. So this is only just one scripture, but when I started looking at it, it is so full of what your identity represents that it needs to be actually developed and looked at. And so that's what we're going to do. Let's, let's begin to look at the passage specifically. It says, he has delivered us. The word deliver here is really interesting. Now, in the, when you look at the gospel stories, Jesus, the, the Greek word that's used there is the word sozo, and it's being used now to do certain things. Sozo means healed, delivered, saved. But the word itself means the action of that happening. So when Jesus went and he spoke a word, they were healed, delivered, and saved. It was the action of speaking the word. That's not the Greek word that's being used here for this word, delivered. It's a different Greek word for delivered. Now, 
why is this important for me to say this? It does mean delivered, but how we get to the idea of being delivered is very important, and it has something to do with your identity in Christ. So when it says the word delivered here, it literally means, in a sense, you're actually in relationship to something. Someone comes and breaks the power of that relationship, and they draw you into a relationship with them. So the, the idea that you have been delivered means that Satan literally is in relationship with you. Christ, when he came to come, when he delivered you, he broke the power of that relationship and he didn't just deliver you, he brought you to, and it's the idea of a connection. You have been brought and connected to the heart of God. And so when Christ delivered you, he didn't just do the act of it, it was in relationship to something. So you, when Christ delivered you, you were broken completely free from the dominion of darkness and Satan, completely. And not only were you just set free, you weren't set free to just kind of exist, you were set free to be connected to something. So it's the idea of a relational deliverance. Now, that, that in and of itself is where we could probably end the sermon and just kind of sing and dance for the next couple of hours, but it actually even gets better than that. It says this, that he has not only delivered us and drawn us to himself, let's look at another word here. It says he's delivered us from the dominion of darkness. Now, dominion is really interesting here because it means um, drawn out of something or the right or privilege to have dominance over something. So, when you are in, before you know Christ, you are in the kingdom of Satan, and that's how the Bible be, describes it. It actually says that he has dominion over you, or he has the right to do the things that he does in your life because of what our ancestors did, or what we participate in. And so there, there really is no ability outside of what Jesus does for you and I that actually sets you free. You cannot set yourself free. This is beyond your right or authority to do. You can't act to get yourself out of this. You have to be delivered from it. And the word dominion here means the legal right to have authority. Now, how does the enemy have a legal right to do the things that he does to people on this planet? Um, it's described this way. It's what we would call the chain of sin and death. Have you guys ever heard that term, the chain of sin and death? So our ancestors rebelled against the Lord, and it's like they released, in a sense, a chain. And there are links to the chain that produce results. So when Adam and Eve sinned, it released discord. Then it released disease, and then dishonor, and then death. A bunch of Ds there, isn't there? And so the idea is, when Adam and Eve sinned, they're this breaking from what God intended for man, the opposite begins to come into the human race. And now the enemy takes that opposite effect and he works it into the human race to bring destruction. And so you and I have been set free from the authority and the right of that. So not only did Jesus break the power that the enemy had over you, he brings you into you and he says, now that authority will never be exercised over you again at all. Now you're going, now wait a minute, I live in a fallen world and I still see the effect of that. Well, it's not coming from Jesus. And when you and I begin, there's sometimes when I come into the body of Christ, I watch how the body of Christ talks about the things they're dealing with. And sometimes the body of Christ says, you know, God brought that on me. And God didn't bring those things on you. He was trying to set you free from those things. And what happens is because we don't know our identity in Christ, we begin to believe that God is like the devil and he isn't. He, he has done this major work to settle you and satisfy you, even in a fallen world, to where you know that dominion does not have any authority over me. In fact, just to kind of help you here, um, do any of you guys ever struggle with sin in your life? So this section, I guess you do. This group didn't respond at all. And so I find this to be true. Um, there have been seasons in my life where I've had sin that I have not overcome and, and been just frustrated with the Lord over it. And like, how is this possible that I have this thing going on inside of me and yet I don't have the ability to overcome this? Well, one day I'm complaining about this to the Lord. And my, my prayer closet, everyone has, I'm always amazed by prayer closets and people's prayer closets. We even had movies that 
talk about people's prayer closets. Mine's my shower. And the reason why is that's the only place my cell phone cannot follow me and no one's allowed to interrupt me. And so usually when I'm taking a shower, I'm praying. And so I'm actually in my shower putting soap in my hair and it's running in my eyes and my eyes are stinging and I, whatever we call prayer sometimes. I'm complaining to the Lord and crying out, why can I not get set free from this thing? Now, here my identity has been established, but I don't know my identity. And so I was amazed at how the Lord responded back to me. He said, really? You're not in bondage to that sin. You just think you are. Because once I set you free, if you go back to sin, you're choosing to go back to sin where before you had no ability to choose. It just drew you into it. And the minute he said that, it was like a changing in my mind. Oh, I'm actually choosing to do this. So that means that the power of choice has been restored to me. And that's what Christ has given you in him. You have been given your authority back to you you've been restored into being an image bearer in the proper way of what Christ has done for you. And so you get to actually choose what's going on in your life instead of being in bondage to the kingdom of darkness and he chooses what you get in your life. Oh, three people. Great. All right. So it's, we're getting there. Let's keep moving forward. So you have been broken for you've been delivered from the dominion. Now, let's keep going on. Let's take the word darkness here. By the way, this is not the Greek word for evil or sin. Now, sometimes I read passages and I think, well, what they're trying to say here is I've been delivered from sin or evil or Satan or demons. And this word is not any of those words, just so we understand it. In fact, this is a very specific word that's used only uniquely as it describes what the word means here. So the, this scripture is after a specific point that the Bible wants you to understand what Jesus has done for you. So it says that he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. The word darkness here is the word for obscurity of mind. So when I have an obscure mind, now you're going, well, what? When I have an obscure mind, it means that my ability to come to truth is not there. So when Christ, in this passage, Paul is saying, now look, what has Jesus actually done to you? What does it actually mean to be a Christian? It means that Jesus went into Satan's kingdom, he called you by name, he purchased you, he broke the power so that you'd have no relationship with him, he would brought you to his heart, and then he did a work in your mind so that you could actually have a sound mind. Now, why is it so important in your identity to understand that you have a sound mind? A sound mind represents the idea that you now have the capacity to receive and understand truth where you did not have an ability to do that before Christ rescued you. This is why, I don't know if you guys ever um, talk with people and you present the gospel to them and they're still in the kingdom of darkness and they look at you like that didn't make any sense to them because they can't have an ability to come to that place. Their mind is darkened and the darkness is that they have not an ability to connect the dots spiritually, but in Christ you've been set free from that. Now, why is it so important as we move forward, because we're going to keep going into the passage, it's going to tell you how important it is that you have a sound mind. But for our question is, why do I need to understand I have a sound mind? God is wanting to relate very specifically with you that truth meets you, you enjoy it, it satisfies you, and you grow into being what God intended you, and you have to have a sound mind to do that. And so this is what Jesus has delivered us from when we say we've been delivered from darkness. He has delivered us not only from the, the relational dynamic of the enemy, but what it has done to our mind. We don't have an obscure mind anymore, which I think we ought to all rejoice about that one. Now, it, that would be good enough, but now the scripture turns and it says, and we've been transferred in, he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So, you know, let's take this word transfer and just look at it here. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the day and age we live in, you and I get on Amazon, we buy something, 
FedEx or UPS shows at our house and whoever, de whoever developed it, they put it in a box and they transfer it from one location to another. It's called a horizontal trans transfer. The word transfer here is not that kind of word. So when Jesus came and rescued you from the kingdom of darkness, brought you to his heart and changed the way you thought, he not only did that, he transferred you. And the word transfer doesn't mean horizontally, it means vertically. So you've been taken from one plane to existence into a higher plane of existence, and now you're going to experience that plane of existence, and that's what your mind is going to be ministered to from that point on. Now that actually means that th that should actually start bringing some scriptures to you that you've been reading for years and, and fill in the gaps that you and I look at. Like it says to us in Ephesians that not only are we seated with Christ, God has seated us with him so that throughout eternity, God can convince you and show you how much he loves you. And it's going to take forever to do that. No, I, am I kind of intense? I get excited when I talk about this stuff. I mean, it's just amazing what Jesus has actually done for you and I. And a lot of times, because we don't understand, hey, I'm in a, I'm in a whole new reality of what existence is, most Christians are trying to go back and live in the system of the world and think that's how you relate to people. And Jesus is saying, no, you're actually unique. I've made you a new creation, and in that new creation, you're at a different level of existence, and I want people to actually see that. And whether you're called weird, unique, or uncommon, that's on purpose. Because people long to have something different than the system of the world that tears at them all the time, and God has made you the light of that existence. And so you get to be not weird, unique in among a group of people because they see a different level of existence and what it does is it creates a longing to come back to paradise that we lost. I heard someone say this is good. It is, isn't this good? <laughs> So you have been transferred up to a higher level or a different way of existence. Now, let's get really practical here. If you've been delivered, let's put it in two categories. What have you actually been delivered from in Christ? Well, the first one is what we call the inward work. What has God inwardly set us free from? And, and you have to do this because sometimes we say words, but we don't lay it out specifically. So people actually let the enemy keep him doing something that they shouldn't be doing, or he tries to trick him into something that's not theirs, and they don't realize they've been liberated so they can stand and say, no, I, I refuse to allow that to be a part of my life. So let's look at it. Would you guys turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5 Verse 19 through 21. Now, <laughs> there are two words for the, the existence of mankind in the New Testament. Two Greek words, rather. And one is fun. Um, it's where we get the word psychology or, or the idea of psychology. It's called sushi. Sushi type life. It sounds like food, doesn't it? Sushi. Uh, that's, it's, it's fleshly life. Now, please understand certain passages is when it uses the word flesh... It means a certain type of existence. So what is a fleshly life? A fleshly life is a, is a person that's animated and is alive, but they do not have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. And so that form of life is called fleshly. Now, the, a fleshly life that we have here in Galatians uh, 5, 19 through 21 it's describing the deeds that come from a fleshly lifestyle, and this is the stuff that's going on in the hearts of people that do not have the Spirit of the Lord dwelling in them. And, that, and what we're seeing here is a contrast. Now, this is important. Before you were in Christ, this is what you lived in. But after Christ, he broke this, and you are not on that level of existence anymore. In fact, when you go back to it, there should be something going on in your life that goes, this is not right. I'm not existing the way I am now created. And so what are those? The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, dispute, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Now, 
Those things, as we talk to the body of Christ, this is, there's always this dialogue going on in the body of Christ. The system of the world is always coming to you and I as Christians and saying, now, we see that you guys say you're different, but we think you should participate with us so that we can accept you. And so, if you guys ever hang around evangelists or people that are trying to reach people all the time, they're trying to figure out, how can I be with non-believers and yet not compromise myself and show the uniqueness of a new creation? That's always the discussion that's going on when you're doing outreach. But are you guys ready? You're to never go back into this thing that Christ has delivered you from for your own benefit of your soul because it's not who you are anymore. You're miserable if you go back to it. And so you guys get it? The system of the world is trying to get you to come back to it all the time. You have to realize Christ has set you free, and if you try to go back to it, you're going back to something that you are not, and you become depressed and miserable if you go back to it. It's not whether, well, I, don't know, I wonder if I'm making Jesus disappointed. You guys get it? You're not that kind of person anymore. It has, it, you will not enjoy it. So you guys ready? Let's just learn to give it up. And stop worrying about, well, I wonder if people like this about me or not like this about me. I understand how rejection affects people, but the point here is I, I can't go back to it because it's, I wasn't created to exist in that. It's like trying to live in water and I wasn't created to function and live in water. I'm going to drown in it after a while. I, I'm not created to live in that atmosphere. Now, would you guys turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 10? Let's look at another interesting scripture. So that's what's going on inwardly. I want to point your attention to something here. In John chapter 10, verse 10, by the way, I believe John chapter 10 is one of the best passages that describes the pastoral ministry in the New Testament and also Jesus being a pastor to the body of Christ. And he talks about it as a shepherd with sheep. And um, one of the things, I'll, I'll give you a couple things so that you have some context here. The reason why sheep know the shepherd's voice is literally from birth, the shepherd holds, holds the, sh the baby lambs next to their heart so they can not only know them, but they're actually in connection with them. And the shepherd names the, the baby lamb. And at night, he, he pours oil on it and sings songs to the baby lamb and gets rid of its cuts and its ticks off his fur. And there's literally this deep connection between every, every lamb and sheep that the shepherd takes care of. Do you guys get it? The shepherd is with the sheep all the time. And so they, 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 have, they have no recognition to any other uh, shepherd. They have no other recognition to any other voice. It's only, his, they actually know the timbre and the strength of the shepherd's voice compared to any other voice that's out there. And Jesus is now coming into this idea and beginning to describe something about you being his sheep, you hearing his voice, and what's coming after you that he's actually given you the ability through his love to withstand. So let's work through that. Here in John chapter 10, verse 10, it makes this statement, and I, I find this fascinating. It says that the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, a lot of times when we read that, I always ask people, what, what's the enemy's job? Well, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I said, now, work that out with me. What does that mean? Well, he, he stole my uncle's car, and he killed my whatever dog or, or something like that. And we, and we relate it to things that are going on in the physical world most of the time. And, and I'm not saying that the enemy doesn't do that, but this passage is not talking about your car being stolen and you losing your job. It ha it's in a context here. So let's keep reading the passage. Jesus says, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says, but I have come to give life and life more abundantly. So the Stealing, killing, and destroying is context to what Jesus wants to give you. Now, have you guys ever taken time to look at this idea of what abundant life is and what Jesus says you're supposed to be actually enjoying that he's purchased for you by dying on the cross? It's called abundant life. Now, I already gave you the contrast. The non-abundant life is the life of the power of the flesh. But what is abundant life? The word abundant, uh, sorry, Forget the word abundant. 
the word life here is really interesting because it's a type of life. Jesus has come to give you abundant, a certain type of life, and he wants to give it to you abundantly. So the word is zoe, and it's a, it's a Greek word, and it means a quality or a spiritual life, and the spiritual life is such quality that it satisfies everything that mankind was created and longs for. And so, and not only does he want to give, he doesn't say, I want to come and give you life. He says, I want to give you life abundantly. Now, before we get into abundant life, let's deal with stealing, killing, and destroying. By the way, those are not noun statements. They're not fact statements. They're verb statements in that text. So, you guys ready? The enemy comes to steal and keep stealing. The enemy comes to uh, um, kill and keep killing. The enemy comes to destroy and keep destroying. Well, what is he killing, uh, stealing, killing, and destroying? Your abundant life. So how does he do that? Discouragement, lies, saying things to you, causing conflict, all of that takes away from what Jesus has promised you, which is called abundant life. And it doesn't mean he does it aggressively in a dramatic way. He does it little by little. So he lies to you and says, God isn't for you. God isn't going to be with you. This, and what happens is, is the dynamic of grace that's living inside of you is saying, no, be full of hope. Be full of faith. Be full of love. And as you listen to that thought and you entertain it and you decide that might be true, it throws a wet blanket on the fire of the abundant life that Jesus is releasing inside of you and he's stealing something from you that's actually yours. All right, let's keep moving forward. Can it get better than this? Yes. So the word for abundant, I mean, sorry, for the word life here, let's give distinction. What is Zoe life? There's a term that's used to, that's one of the names of God that's in the Old Testament. So we have Jehovah Rapha, we have Jehovah Nisi, we have Jehovah Tiskadu, we have Jehovah Shalom. And these names of God represent the character of God. So the reason why God wanted to be known not only by his name, but also by his character, is it, it establishes the idea that God's nature does not change. So the God that said, I'm Jehovah Rapha, way back there in Exodus 15, is the same guy you're relating to today, and so how he acted back then is how he acts today. And it gives you security knowing his nature doesn't change. Now we're trying to deal with what is abundant life. So he says he's Jehovah Shalom. The, the way that we translate it is what we would call a weak translation of the word shalom. We, we get the right definition. It means peace, but you had to get to peace a certain way. So here's what shalom actually means. Wholeness and prosperity in every area of your life that satisfies you so deeply that you're at peace. What does Jesus promise as abundant life? Now, I think that statement without the word abundance is pretty powerful. Wholeness and prosperity in every area of your life that satisfies you so deeply, you're at peace. He not only says, that's what a, uh, abundant life is, but I, uh, I'm sorry, that's what life is. I want to add an abundance to wholeness, prosperity that satisfies you so deeply that you're at peace. Do you guys get it? That's what the enemy's trying to steal from you. That's what Jesus has taken you to a higher, you are in a higher level of existence of what we call wholeness and prosperity coming to you from the throne of God forever. And the enemy is trying to steal it from you. And he realizes once you realize you've been delivered from that, you can actually stand and say, no. See, it's easy to steal someone's inheritance when they don't know it. Now, right here, as I always say, we can stop and again rejoice the rest of the day, but the passage still gets better. We've not only been transferred into a higher level of existence, it uses a term here about that level of existence. It's called, we have been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, when I was first looking at that, I thought, why, do they have, why didn't they say we were transferred into the kingdom of his son? Why did it use the word beloved son? Uh, this is just... This is just awesome. 
So what, this prosperity and wholeness, the Bible now wants to define it very specifically to you. So the higher plane of existence that you and I in Christ are experiencing isn't just wholeness and prosperity. It's now relational wholeness and prosperity. And what I mean is, is this is how Jesus defined it. He said, the love that the Father has for me is now going to be given to you. And so the same way the Father loved the Son is what is being poured to you right now and it is never going to stop because you're in the level of the kingdom and the reign of the belovedness of the Son that comes from the Father is now touching you. You are in the same position that Jesus was to have the same level of the Father's love being poured in you forever. Gosh, that gets good. <laughs> so now what is, this is the identity statement he's saying not only did Jesus destroy everything that the enemy did now the level of existence that I am put in means that the same way that the father intentionally loved the son I am now standing under that waterfall and it is splashing on me continually and it's nurturing me and it's watering me and it's supposed to cause a reaction inside of me and I'm supposed to actually back up and go, wait a minute, can it get any better than this? And the answer is yes. <laughs> the Christian experience is to be defined, not from just being delivered from the kingdom of darkness, but because of this place that I've been called to stand before God that in God's eyes you and I look just like Jesus and how much the Father loved Jesus is what is being poured towards you and I now. Now do you guys do like I do? Well that sounds too good to be true. Does God watch how I live my life? Of course God knows how you live your life and he knows you have no ability to get yourself out of it so he did it all for you. That's the most wonderful thing about identity is it's not about how much you do for God. It's about how much he does for you and how much you enjoy it. <laughs> okay, I'll see it. I'm going to back up and go over here and say the same thing. <laughs> God didn't ask you to do a big thing for him. He asked you to become a receiver and most believers don't receive. They try to perform to get God to love them. If you're already in the highest level of the form of love that God can give, there's nothing you can do to get more. You just have to be on the receiving end. Do you guys understand that when you're under a waterfall, you can't position yourself if you're a rock under the waterfall to get more of the same thing. You just stand there and receive it. That's what you've been created. You're now in his kingdom. And he is pouring on you. The love that he has for his son is now pouring on you and that is the atmosphere that you and I breathe all the time and so I, I get it he's trying to liberate you religion in the kingdom of darkness is about earning the approval of a false god relationship in the kingdom of God is about you not trying to earn anything but just receiving from the fountain of all things and letting joy and enjoyment come into your experience isn't our identity in Christ awesome? We've only looked at one scripture. There's more than 55 different scriptures trying to convince you and I, this is how God really has loved you. And what it's supposed to do to you and I is it's supposed to break us open to realize I have no fear anymore. I'm fully accepted by this God that Christ has done for me. I'm grateful and now my attitude shifts into the reality of the kingdom of the Son. And instead of being upset about everything and worried about like the system of the world is, I'm liberated into joy, thankfulness, and now I can't wait to live to tomorrow because I'm experience in eternity now and so I enjoy life because I get to be under a fountain of something that will never be diminished in my life will only increase. Would you guys like to turn your hearts with me? Let's, let's look to the Father now and let him wa do a washing in our hearts. Okay, let's pray. What you've done for us, Lord, what you've done for us, Holy Spirit and God the Father, thank you. Thank you that you have brought us to this place. By your powerful mercy, you have done this for us, Lord. 
And Lord, anywhere in our hearts where the enemy has convinced us that we are overcome, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I break the power of that over our thoughts and our minds. And the lying, the stealing, and the killing of our abundant life, I break the power of that. And I ask that our minds and our souls would come into our inheritance. Change us, Lord. Do the work of transformation that you have ordained for us. As we move into this Christmas season, I ask that it wouldn't just be about presence and acknowledging your son's birth, but it would literally be a joyous time of your kingdom for families. Let it just be released in the midst of us, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right. I'm going to turn my attention to some things the Lord wants to minister to people with here today. Okay, um, let's start with your bodies. Uh, that's probably a good place to start. If you're dealing with rib, the Lord is showing me some people are dealing with rib pain. I don't know what it's from, but if you have pain in your ribs, would you stand? The Lord would like to minister to you. I'm so sorry you're dealing with that. You're already standing. Um, and I really, I'm sorry you're having to deal with that. Would you mind putting your hands out since it's like Christmas time, like you're receiving a gift? Now, people are always asking me, how do you receive the things the Lord wants to give you? Well, you don't do anything. You just stand there. And so you don't need to pray. We're going to pray for you. So Holy Spirit, would you come right now? Release your power and your presence over your sons and daughters. Break the power of this weakness and this infirmity. And I ask, Lord, that you would restore them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, bring your healing power over their ribs and, in a sense, mend them, Lord, right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, mighty one. We bless your name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Is someone here dealing... Uh, I was thought there was uh, never heard a word like this. I'm serious. I've been doing this for more than 20 years. And when the Lord told this to me, I thought, wow, I don't ever remember getting something like this. Are you de is someone here dealing with a rash that they have that they're not getting over? A rash in their skin that they are not getting. I am so sorry you're dealing with that. Anyone else? Please stand if you wouldn't mind. And just kind of put your hands out like this. I felt like the Lord was saying uh, he really wanted to deal with that specifically, just to take it away. So, Holy Spirit, come right now. I break the power of this infirmity and this disease. I command it to lift off of them right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask that a, a washing and a restoration would come to their skin right now. And I ask that you would bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, is there a gentleman here named? Okay, so the way we're going to do it is if you're here, stand. Or if you know someone that's named this, you can also stand for it. Is there a gentleman here named Dan? And your full name is Daniel. Dan. Now, is someone here also related to someone named Dan or Daniel? Brother? <laughs> okay. Okay. Son-in-law? Cousin. Oh, wow. I get to try to deal with all of this. Okay. Now, here's how it works. I'm, one of you, this is going to apply to you. The rest of you, I'm going to just pray a blessing for. So here's what the Lord was showing me. Dan, or a name of Daniel, has, is struggling with weakness in his body. That's what the Lord was actually showing me. And the Lord was saying that he was going to actually come and strengthen him and then release wisdom into his life. Does that make sense to any of you guys? Weakness in their body. Does that make sense to you? Okay, does that make sense to you? That makes sense to you. Oh, and you didn't even stand. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so let's pray. 
let's pray for this. So the rest of you, I don't believe God didn't want me to not call you out. So we're going to pray for the person named Dan or Daniel, but we're going to pray for this specifically. So Holy Spirit, would you come right now? And for this Daniel, the weakness that he's dealing with in his body, I ask that you'd release your power and your presence to restore him. And for all these other people named Daniel, Lord, I don't believe you just have me call this out and, and, and not go somewhere. Come near them and touch them and release your power and your presence over them and bring your goodness to them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right, uh, the next one was this. There's a, a Tim here, a gentleman named Tim. Is that you? Tim. Okay, Stan. <laughs> okay, um, do you, are you, do you have a company or, or, or what, what's your work? Were you in construction or something like that? Oh, okay, good. So I, hopefully this is you because he showed me a construction, something about construction, but it had to do with the favor of the Lord in your life, that God is actually going to be bringing favor to you. So can we pray for that, Tim? All right, so just kind of put your hands out. So Holy Spirit, just bring your power and your presence to Tim. Yeah, you're not done. In fact, the Lord says that your latter years are going to be greater than your former years and that you need to get ready for what the Lord is going to be doing in your life and that God wanted specifically to know that his favor is resting upon you and get ready for the good things that God is going to call you to. So, Lord, release that over Tim. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, you can, that's all right. You can clap. That works. Um, now, I, I, it's kind of funny when I got this, but Kim, I, I got your name. Where are you, Kim? Uh, and you're Kim? So we have two Kims, so I get to try to figure this one out. Kim, do you have a son? Does one of them have brown hair? Okay, do you have a son? Okay, so it's, her, it's you. Because I, I saw you and a, a young man right next to you. So would you stand? Let me go ahead and give this to you. So, um, Oh, okay, well, that's clever. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so the Lord showed me your son, and he actually said that, um, I saw him standing right next to you, and he had brown hair, and the Lord actually said that there's a leadership gift resting on his life that he wanted you to pay attention to. And he's actually going into a transition where the Lord is actually going to engage him and awaken that in his life. So can we pray for him about that? So Holy Spirit, would you come to this young man? Would you release this leadership anointing in his life? Would you cause him to um, just the prayers that she has been praying for this person? I ask that she would recognize her prayers have been heard by you, Lord, and that you would raise him up and let the blessing of the Lord be upon this young man. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right. Um, even though you didn't have a son, would you stand? Because right when I was about to start praying for the Lord said he actually wanted me to pray for you. So would that be okay? So you're Kim, right? Okay. Holy Spirit, would you just come right now to Kim? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Kim, um, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if you see this yourself this way, but you actually, uh, the Lord has actually called you to, to actually restore people. There is a call in your life to actually heal and restore people, specifically in the arena of relationships. And so Jesus is going to actually use you as a mender of people's lives and actually restore people. In fact, it's going to be introduced to you in such a way that it's going to go deep in your life. And then you're going to find that a lot of people start showing up around you and he's going to use you as a person to mend people's minds and people's emotions. And so could we pray for that blessing just to rest on you? So Father, for Kim, would you release your power and your presence over her life? You'd let your goodness rest upon her. I thank you for this ministry of restoration that you've given her, and I ask that it would come forth right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Kim. All right, now you guys realize that this is how words of knowledge work. I have to stretch myself and do it. Isn't that fun? Five of you agree. Okay, good. Okay, someone here have a birthday on March 10th. March 10th. Your son does. How would you stand? Because that's the Lord said, call up this. <laughs> I thought it was funny. He said, I'm going to give you March 10th, but I'm not going to tell you anything. 
You're, you're all great. Okay, so Paul, go ahead. And her, whose daughter? Oh, you're, <laughs> okay, three. Thank you, Lord. All right, so let's start here. Holy Spirit, just release your power and your presence over this son right now. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in his life also. I ask, Lord, that you would um, develop this internal strength that you're doing in his life right now. And this thing about adventure that he's wanting to walk in, I ask that you would bless him in and cause your goodness to be with him. And that you are his strength and his high tower and that they can trust you for what you're doing in his life. I thank you that um, you're going to not only watch over him, but there is your protection resting on him, and he is going to recognize favor in his life. And I just thank you for that, Lord, and I bless it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Okay, who else had the Paul, and who, who was it back here? And her name is? Donna. Donna. Okay, so I'm going to pray for your daughter, okay? All right, so Holy Spirit, just bring your power and your presence around Jackie. Hmm. Uh, so this thing that she's going through where she's trying to connect with you and know you more, I ask that you would do this for this daughter. Just release your power and your presence over her. And I ask that there would be... Uh, in a sense, an appearing of your goodness and your glory over her life and that you would touch her deeply. Cause the sense of wandering to lift off of her and bless her in the name of Jesus. Amen. And, and your name specifically was? Donna. Uh, also, the Lord wants me to pray for you too also. So Holy Spirit, would you just bring your, your power over her body right now? And the sense of just uh, a weakness that she's feeling in her body, I break the power of that right now. And I ask that a strength that comes from your throne would rest upon her right now, Lord. Uh, specifically, um, I feel like the Lord's saying that he's going to move over your lower back and your hip area and just bring, bring strength to it. And so, Lord, I ask that you'd release that right now. Just let your healing presence and power be upon Donna also. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Man. All right, but this is the gentleman I travel with. This is Paul. So isn't that nice that we got your brother's birthday, Paul? So. Okay, so Paul, I feel like the Lord's showing me that um, your brother is actually in the process right now of having the Lord actually deal with him and that his light is actually coming near him. And it has something to do with the prayer that you've been actually praying for him. The Lord has actually heard that and is moving on his behalf. So he wants you to stay with it, okay? And so, Lord, for this brother, I uh, ask that you would bless him and that you would strengthen him. And all the things that he's in conflict with right now, Lord, speak to him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Paul. All right, uh, I think this is, an, oh, yeah. Is there a Bill and Wendy Stratford here? Bill and Wendy Stratford. I so love doing this and then having people laugh as I'm doing it. It's like, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to do that. Okay. What we found is as I'm getting these names specifically, if they're not here, I'm going to give it and release it anyways because I trust what God is doing with this stuff, okay? Uh, we found that as we give these, the person ends up hearing the audio or the video or they end up coming and people give them the word. So let me go ahead and do this. Bill and Wendy Stratford. Lord, I just thank you that you wanted me to call them out specifically by name and had something to do with favor over their marriage and favor over their work. And I ask that you would cause your blessing to rest on them. And I ask that your goodness would be with them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right, now, I seriously, uh, this is the last one he gave me, and when he gave it to me, I thought, man, I do not want to give this one, But because who knows what it's going to be. He told me, I want you to call out people that love chocolate ice cream. <laughs> it's going to be 100 people. I mean, so who here really, every time you get ice cream, it's chocolate ice cream? So, wow, I didn't know we had so many chocoholics in the room. All right, so this, please put your hands out. I, I guess he's going to give you chocolate for Christmas or something. Here we go. 
Holy Spirit, just come right now. Just bring your power and your presence over these people. And you called them out by this. Hmm. All right, so for you guys, there's a river of God that is coming from the throne of God for you in this season of your life. And God is going to pour a sense of fulfillment that is going to satisfy you beyond chocolate. And God has heard the longing that is going on in your heart right now, and he is going to come and satisfy it. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command joy over your life and peace. In the name of Jesus. Now release it, Lord. Let it come forth. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Uh, how am I ever going to do this? I, ha I need to turn it over to Bart. Are you ready, Bart? Okay, here he comes. Thank you, guys. Now, we need, we need to take an offering for um, our guest speaker. Again, make your checks out to Amber Hills Church. But before we do, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> you guys are making this easy. I, God gave me one, a word of knowledge, <clears throat> and I have to preface it with this. God does not condemn but he does lovingly correct. Um, somewhere early, wow, sorry. Somewhere early in these words of knowledge, God said, somebody is thinking this very thought. This, this type of ministry is just a shot in the dark. And God says, yes. What is darkness in his sermon? Okay? What, what was it? An obscurity of mind. And God uses words of knowledge to literally shoot, destroy a believer's obscurity of mind. To prove to you that he can speak specifically, I mean, into the details of your life. And literally cancel that that you've partnered with in a lie of the security of the mind. Going, no, you know, I'm, I'm, bound, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, you know. It's like, no. No, 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 no. God knows your identity so much and the identity that he's declared over you that he'll speak directly into it to break that darkness, to shoot into the darkness. So, God, I just thank you, <laughs> Lord, that, that those words of knowledge are bullets <laughs> to destroy any stronghold the enemy has over our mind so that we can be released into the full knowledge of God and walk in it because that's what you have designed us to do. Um, that is the, oh, when Jesus said, uh, I am the truth and the truth will set you free, that clarity of the knowledge of the word of God is the new reality of your new identity. So God, I just declare that over this body in Jesus' name. And now Lord, bless Brian as he brings this truth, God, and continues to release the bullets, <laughs> the words of knowledge to do that very thing to just shoot down the darkness of this obscurity of our mind, to bring clarity once again, to hearing the voice of God, to walking in uh, response to the voice of God in and over our life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not going to ask, who was thinking that? Um, <laughs> but it was so clear. I mean, it, it was just one of those, I, I can't ignore this. And God's answer was, yes. I was like, oh, God, you're so cool. You know? Uh, and it's that unoffendability of God. You know? And, and one of that, you, you know, one of the things you learn in religion is, you know, how dare you even think about offending God or he will crush you, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah. That's the guy who gave his only begotten son to come to earth, take on the form of man for the sole purpose of dying for our sins. Yeah, he wants to crush us. There's a lie. There's obscurity of mind that God wants to release you from. So stand with me this morning. Mm. 
God, first of all, I thank you for releasing the truth of the word of God. Lord, it, it is, uh, it's our sword <laughs> to pierce the darkness. God, it, it is uh, the bullets <laughs> to, to, to shoot down the obscurity of, of mind. And Lord, I pray that we will walk out <laughs> with the clips loaded <laughs> with your word, to speak forth the word of truth into people's lives. God, specifically, I show you doing uh, uh, people doing that around the, the Christmas tree, around the Christmas dinner with their family, declaring and speaking truth into their lives. So, Lord, we break off um, the depression. Lord, um, the loneliness that comes from those who, who are alone, but they're, they're not alone because you're with them. And Lord, I pray that truth, I declare that truth, that you be in every home, in every situation, and remind all believers that that's not their reality. Their reality in Christ is that they carry Jesus. And so they, they walk as a living container of the spirit of Christmas to pour it out upon all those they come in contact with. So they are not hopeless, but they are carriers of the hope and the life, and the joy and the peace of Christmas for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.